Welcome everyone. This is the End Time Sanctuary Present Truth Ministries. This time we are going to discuss a topic, imperatives of realities in Jesus' typological, prophetic, eschatological events in Matthew 24. A very long title but I think a short sermon. It is a study on Matthew chapter 24. And I want to start because there is a word that many of us are not so acquainted. For example, typology. Uh, what is really is a typology? Typology is a way of interpreting that is so specialized, particular in New Testament. Let me read. It is an institution, historical events, or person ordained by God which prefigures some redemptive truth and revelational process which begins in Old Testament and finds its fulfillment in the New Testament. In fact, the entire New Testament is essentially characterized by typology and eschatological application of the Old Testament. Both horizontal and vertical typology begins, centers, and terminates in Christ. So, as, you, as we will learn later, I just put two examples that is found in Matthew 24. Sanctuary and the Sabbath are institution. The flood and destruction of Jerusalem are historical events. Noah and Lot are persons. So, there's so many institutions in the Old Testament, historical events and persons, which prefigure, which prefigure about Jesus Christ and about the church that will be fulfilled in the New Testament. So, that is the reason why this is typological. It is a prophecy, but not only is catological or last day events, but it is a type, meaning to say, there is a prefigure that would happen because the type is always greater uh, than when it, is, it, it comes to fulfillment. Okay? But why is it that I'm interested with this one? Because, as you have understand, the eschatology of Jesus, especially chapter 24, is linked with the sanctuary. For example, verses 1, 1 to 3, Jesus was talking. He was in uh, the presence of the temple of Solomon. Or uh, originally, that is the temple of Solomon. And then, according to Ellen White in the Desire of Ages, people have heard, plenty of people have heard that not one of the stones will not be thrown down. However, when the apostles, four of them, ask the question, when it will happen, what is the signs of the end of the, uh, of the world and your coming, Jesus did not answer that. In fact, uh, I have been to that place. From the eastern gate, then I walk through down in the Kidron Valley, then up to Mount Olives. In Mount Olives, I, can, I, I sat there and I look at, but today there's no longer a sanctuary but is the, the Muslim doom. So what it means is there is that when Jesus reached at Mount Olives, then privately, that the, the disciples ask, when this will happen? What is the signs of the end? And then Jesus answer, answer to them, it's a very strange answer. Reason, he did not answer the three questions that the disciples had asked. In fact, if you read the next verse, his answer was totally different from their questions. Because you need to understand the context of Matthew 24 is sanctuary, which if you go to verse 15 of Matthew 24, it is also taken from Daniel 8 verse 13, in which verse 14 is tell us about the 2,300 days then the sanctuary shall be cleansed, meaning it has a double connection 
of the sanctuary that was presented by Daniel and Jesus' eschatology is centered on the sanctuary. That's why if you look at our 28 fundamental beliefs, our eschatology starts with the sanctuary. Not on the second coming, not the signs of second coming. It is in the sanctuary because that's really is the beginning, the middle, and the ends of everything. And so, in the book of Revelation, we need to connect also because that's the only book of the entire Bible that is, is structurally, theologically centered on sanctuary. For example, let's read here. I have uh, in, the, in the slide, for example, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18 is the prologue. And then the seven, the messages to the seven churches is introduced by the sanctuary view. Then the seven seals is preclude, there is a preclude by sanctuary sin. The seven trumpets begin by a sanctuary vista. And the wrath of the nation is preambled by the sanctuary portrayal. The last seven plagues is also start with a sanctuary sin. And the eschatological consummation of the world, it opens with a sanctuary site. And lastly, number seven, the new Jerusalem expressed by the sanctuary display. Did you see now the center? That Matthew 24 really is sanctuary-centered eschatology. And so, we need to understand of this because there are nine imperatives. We're going to discuss. I'm not going to discuss all those signs, but we need to discover the imperatives in chapter 24, which many of us, sometimes when we read, there is a problem. I've been, I've been teaching eschatology for many, many years. And so, we need to understand. Let's discuss the number one, imperative, okay? The imperatives of realities in Matthew 24 is that, number one, the end time messages of Matthew 24, whole destiny of God's people. Why is that? Let me read from Ellen White. Because this prophecy of Jesus is an important to God's people in the last days. Ellen White speaks of its utmost important for God's people to understand Matthew 24. She said, The 24th chapter of Matthew is presented to me again and again as something <clears throat> excuse me, that is to be brought to the attention of all. Repeatedly, God shown to her, Matthew 24, to be brought to the attention of all, not just a few of all. We are living today, she said, in the time where prediction of these chapters are fulfilling. She said, let our ministers, teacher, explain this prophecy to those whom they instruct. Let them live out their discourses matter of minor importance and present the truths that will decide the destiny of souls. Gospel Workers 148. Did you understand what Ellen White is emphasizing? She said, live out those discourses, matters of minor consequence, but present these truths because that will decide the destiny of souls. In fact, if you read chapter 29 of that beautiful book, The Desire of Ages, entitled On Mount of Olives, pages 2, 627, 636, are based on Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Because the message really is so important to Jesus that he told to his disciples to pay attention. Number two, the purpose why Jesus gave this typological prophetic last day events. The recipient really is God's people. He gave advanced timeline of events from Jesus' death until his second coming. The specific reasons are given by the Lord. He said, take heed that no one deceive you 
for many in my name will come in my name saying I am Christ and will deceive many. This is the question. Supposed to be this is the answer of the questions of the disciples. When this happens, what is the signs? Uh, the coming of your coming. Jesus did not answer that, but Jesus changed the agenda into what he says. Be careful that no one will deceive you because there are many false Christs and false prophets and they will deceive many. In fact, the key word of the chapter is be not be deceived. So this is really a crucial thing for Jesus. For anyone says to you, look, here is Christ or there. Do not believe it. False Christ and false prophets will rise and great, uh, great signs and wonders to deceive even if possible to the elect. See, I behold, see, behold, I told you beforehand, Matthew 24, 23, 25. Did you understand? I hope we understand that the message, the number one message of Jesus in Matthew 24, the purpose why it was given was that deception is global and the most dangerous of all deception that would be coming in our world. In fact, I have studied that there are four areas of deception that you can get out of the three recorded last day events in the Gospels. The four areas of deception there are common among the synoptic writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The common among the three writers are the false Christ, the false prophet, the signs and wonders, but Luke has added, which is unique, he added snare or trap. And it has not yet, nothing to do with false Christ. It has nothing to do with false prophets and signs and wonders, but how we live as a Christian. In fact, in verses 21, uh, chapter 21, verses 34 to 36, how we live, she said, be careful that, that they will come, your carousing dissipation means wasting everything has no eternal value. And then with drunkenness, worries, anxiety, and cares of this life, and that they will come to you as a snare or a trap. Here are the four areas of deception, in which we are going to discuss the next episode. But just look at here, why it is very important. Areas of deception, false prophets, false Christ, signs and wonders, and a snare personnel. Luke has taken the idea that we can be deceived by our own self, our own thinking. And so we need to look at this, a very important note. For example, throughout history, Satan has been attacking the church by means of uh, persecuting force and coercion. But as he begins the final attack, in the end time remnant, his strategy changes from coercion to deception. The ship of Satan's strategy corresponds to the transition from historical to eschatological focus of revelation. The word deceive does not occur at all. In any of the historical section of Revelation, that is chapter 4 to 11. However, it is used regularly in the eschatological chapters of Revelation chapter 12 to 20 to describe Satan's end time activities in preparing the final crisis. That's why Jesus is telling us, be not be deceived, I told you. But many of us are not really aware of that seriously. And so, there is astounding truth in the word, in the Greek word, planisi, to deceive. It is used seven times, and theologically means complete, fullness, perfect deception. It's seven times in the book of Revelation. Chapter 12, verse 9, 13, verse 14, 18 verse 23, 19 verse 20, 20 
verses 3, 8, and 10. What's the context? The context of deception is the entire world. And the last mention of deception, Satan is cast into the lake of fire. And very interesting also to note that in the four, in the, in the synoptic gospel, the word deceive is used eight times. So, eight and seven are number of perfection. As we understand, according to history, Ellen White says, before the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in AD 70, false prophets did rise, deceiving people and leading great multitudes, numbers into the deserts, magicians and sorcerers, claiming miracles into the mountain, solicitors and departed spirit, telling people that Christ is there. Desire of Ages 631. Meaning to say, before the final destruction of the rebellious city, false prophets arise. In fact, not only they arise, but some of them are paid by the religious leaders of Jerusalem to predict that this really city will not be destroyed. However, we need to understand what happened when Jesus is telling us that deception by false prophets and what I'm interested here, what Ellen White is saying is that it is those evil spirits, the spirits of who are dead, are coming and telling the people, the Jews, that the Messiah is there, go there. And if you read the book of Acts, you will find, I think, three references of a false Messiah immediately. Number three. Imperatives of realities in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 24, and also Luke 17, 20, and 39, because that's part of the eschatology, but I don't know the reason until now why it was separated. But these three records of eschatology of Jesus Christ should be studied together to get the whole message of truth. Why? There are reasons. There are reasons why we need. Because there are common and distinct things among the three writers. The last day events had been repeated in synoptic gospel by Jesus. And so each writer provides some aspect by which the whole truth be seen when it is compared for in a different perspective. For example, number one. In Matthew, it mentions... Nations against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famine, pestilence, and earthquake. Matthew 24, 7. But when you look at Luke, she said, Great earthquakes, famines, pestilences, fearful sights, great signs. So here is now the perspective of a different writer. And when you fuse them together, you get the whole picture of the message. That's why there is an imperative when you study the last day events of Jesus, the three chapters should be studied together, not to be separated. Look again in the book of Mark 13 verse 8. Nation against nation, there are earthquakes in various places, famines, but he added, troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Troubles mean social unrest, civil war, riots, or upheavals. Now we get now the picture why we need. Example number two. Therefore, when you see abomination and desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads it, let him understand. Is this the holy place part of the sanctuary? But look at Observe Luke 21, 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the armies, they know that desolation. The Roman army surround the city of Jerusalem. This is abomination that lead to desolation. But Matthew is a different. But look at again with Mark 13 verse 14. When you see the abomination and desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing out it standing where it ought not, 
Let he, the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Here we get really the whole picture because common, there is commonalities and yet there is distinction that make the whole picture we see the wholeness of the message. Example number three. And they will fall in the edge of sword and lay the way captive to, into nations and Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. These are not found in Mark and in Matthew. That is Luke 21.4. There are four things there. Okay, the age of the sword, lay the way captive, into nations trampled by Gentiles, and is fulfilled. If we look at here, this way, the, the, the third imperative is to study together. And in fact, in Luke 21, 24, should be compared with Revelation. Because the statement in Revelation, leave out the court which is outside of the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will trade the holy city and their food for 42 months. And it will give power to my two witness, and they will prophesy 1,260 days, clothed in a sackcloth. Revelation 11, 2 and 3. Let's look at that first, what Jesus is saying in Revelation. That Matthew should be compared, because the fullness of of Jesus, the completeness of Jesus' eschatology is found all in the book of Revelation. But let's compare this, Matthew 24 and Revelation 6. Matthew 24 verses 4 and 14, that is generalities of the Christian age, equivalent to Revelation uh, 6 verses 1 to 8. 15 verses 15 to 28, the great tribulation of God's people, which is equivalent also so Revelation 6 verses 9 to 11 and verses 29 to 31, the specific sign of the coming of Jesus. So meaning to say, Matthew 24, it has its full fulfillment in Revelation in a global scale. Let me go back again. Number four, Matthew 24 as a type has two full fulfillment. One is local and the other is global. That's why when I teach eschatology, many of them are surprised. I said, okay, open your Bible to Matthew 24. Look at those things that are locally signs and those also of global signs. Then turn to Luke 21. Look at what is local, what is global, because Jesus fused them together and it's he left to us how to discern which are local signs and which are global signs. And then I told my student, I told them, look at, because there are local signs that has oriented towards global realization. So it has two, two full fulfillment. One is local, one is global. As you look at here, we need to distinguish. For example, Jesus says, Then he went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? As surely I see to you, not one stone shall be left upon another, and that not shall be thrown down. Not as a, now as a seat, he sat at Mount Olives. The disciples came to him privately, and saying, tell us, when these things be, and what will be the signs of your coming and the end, and the end of the age? Matthew 24, 3. So there is a question there of Jesus. When this temple will be destroyed, what is the sign of your coming? And when is the end of the age? These questions are blending two events and call for two applications. One, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the other is the destructions of the world. Listen to what Ellen White says. In theological deep insight in Matthew 24, the prophecy he uttered has twofold in its meaning. While foreshadowing the destruction of Jerusalem, that is local, prefigure also the terrors of the last great day, that is global, great controversy, phase 25. So that is typology. 
Meaning to say, what happened in the city of Jerusalem in AD 70 just mirror what happened, the terrors and the disaster and trouble and problem of the entire world because that is a type. Second, Ellen White says in the Great Controversy, page 22, Christ saw in Jerusalem a symbol of the world hardened in unbelief, rebellion and hastening on to meet the retributive judgment of God. Jesus, looking down to the last generation, saw the world involved in deception, similar to that which caused the destruction of Jerusalem. Look at it again. Meaning to say, this is type. The world will come as a whole in rebellion against God. Because that is a type. Remember that Jerusalem is God's people. In fact, I have a series of studies that I have entitled From a Virgin to Harlot. This started as a virgin but ended as a harlot. This is what happened in the city of Jerusalem, especially when Jesus, the Messiah, whom they are looking for, where the prophecy looked forward, when he arrived, he was persecuted and finally rejected and nailed him to the cross. And their probation was closed when he hung Jesus on the cross, but yet God gave them another 40 years and in 70 years, it was all destroyed. So, listen to what Ellen White is saying. Ellen White notes, while this prophecy, Matthew 24, received a partial fulfillment at the destruction of Jerusalem, they have a more direct application to the last days. Testimonies, for the church, volume 5, 753. The ruin of Jerusalem was a symbol of the final ruin that shall overwhelm the world. The prophecies received a partial fulfillment in the overthrow of Jerusalem have a more direct application to the last days. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, 120 and 121. See, Father said, the whole 24th chapter of Matthew is a prophecy concerning the events that precedes this event and destruction of Jerusalem is used to typify the last great destruction of the world by fire. Last day events, page 18. And so, as we look at, we have to understand what happened. Did you remember that this Matthew 24 is directly related to the seven churches, to the seven cells, to the seven trumpets? Why is that? Because the seven churches portray the spiritual condition of the church in the different period of church history. And the seven cell refers to the Christians and their response to the gospel. So we have there the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse. These are the spiritual condition of the response in the gospels. And the seven trumpets refers to God's intervention in history in response to the prayer of the oppressed people. It sounds God's judgments against those who harm his people, the, the punitive yet still mixed with mercy. As we look at that, it means to say, we who claim to be God's people, our book, priority, Ellen White says, live other discourse matters not so really great important and stay on Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation so that we may get the whole thing. Number five, Matthew 24 should be complemented with Ellen White book, The Great Controversy. Ellen White amplified Matthew 24 in his book into 42 chapters. This is a very interesting. Just imagine Ellen White start the book in the chapter, Destruction of Jerusalem, and it ends with the end of the world. 42 chapters. And many of us are not aware of that. We just look at it from Ellen White that this book, ah, this is a past history. No. Ellen White was given a message to write so that God's people would continue to follow. Where are they? To check where they are. Where are we in history? 
So that should be taken as a complementary, complement, to complement Matthew 24. In fact, in the chapters, I have read that several times, Ellen White says, God had sent already all the last day events, but as if the people of God did not know, as if this thing was not revealed. She was so shocked with that. So we need to read, my brothers and sisters, why you can afford to buy so many things and yet don't read this book that would help us, encourage us, improve us, prepare us for the great day of the coming of the Lord. The problem is that many of us will say, according to the comments of Ellen White, probably that is a correct terminology. But she was shown to God what was really going to happen on planet Earth. Let's go to number six. Imperatives. Events in Matthew 24 follow a strict chronological order or sequence. Observe the following data from chapter six to chapter, no, from verses six, I mean, to verses 30. It has a repeated marker for times indicating sequence. The marker is then. For example, this marker repeated four times that indicate transitions, chronological order or sequence. The word is then. Look at the verse 9. And then they will deliver you. Again, repeated in verse 21. For then there will be a great tribulation. Verse 23. Then if anyone says, and finally, then the sign, the Son of God. This should be taken into consideration when we study Matthew 24. It is a marker. Let's go to number seven. The number seven is so important. The recipient of the message of Matthew 24. As you look at, many of them say, ah, I have heard that from churches, church member. It was only good pastor for those who listened to Jesus. Yes. But let's look at, because strictly, Matthew follow chronological sequence from Jesus' time to second coming. It means the messages are intended really to his disciples, but also to the next generations of Christians until the last generation of Christians which ends the world. It means the message is for all Christians from disciples of all the ages until the end of time. Just let us look at the personal pronoun you, addressed primarily to the second person, that is, the disciples. But notice carefully, the word you includes you and me. In the following biblical passages, for example, let's look at Matthew 28, the Greek commission. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven. Go therefore, make disciples to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Did you understand the word you? If that is only exclusive to the disciples, then why we do today? Let's look again. John 14, verses 1 to 3. Let your heart not be troubled. You believe in me. You believe in God. In my father's house, there are so many. Mention if I were, I would go and have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you may be also. That's the disciples. But that is also for us. And sometimes uh, I just love myself because many of our church members look at this verse that Jesus is preparing mansion. But if you study deeply these verses of John 14, 1 to 3, it talks about sanctuary that he prepared. It's not 
He is making. I sat one morning at Sabbath school in Ayas, and there were retired pastor and they asked our teacher, he said, Pastor, why is it? How long? What? How, how huge is the building, exquisite the building that Jesus was preparing the 2,000 years he has not yet finished. <laughs> I just bite my lips and look at because that is not. If we understand a simple theology is this. When Jesus finished his mediatory work in the most holy place, he removed his priestly clothes and changed it into a kingly robe and he come out from the sanctuary and come to planet Earth. Did you understand? That the location, the place he prepared is a ministry for our behalf. And when he finished that, he will come from that and come to planet Earth. So the you there is very interesting. Let's go to John 16, verses 1 and 2. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made stumble. They will put you on the synagogue. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he offer God's service. The you there includes all the disciples of the ages who had been suffering the same as what Jesus had prophesied. True Christians who listen to Jesus Christ's prophetic warning are purifying the souls by obedience of the truth. That's what Ellen White says. How we are purified? Obedience to the truth. That is Desire of Ages 634. And they who are waiting, watching, and working. Desire of Ages 636. As a type, Christians who obey the warning and not one Christian perish when the city fall after 40 years of Jesus' production. So here is the watchword. What's the watchword? When we watch the signs, we wait, let us keep working. Because if you read really the chapter there, uh, on the Mount of Olives, you will see what happened to the Christians. Number eight, Matthew ends with sealing and final separation. This is the eight imperatives of realities that we need to know. It ends with sealing and final separation. Perhaps you have not noticed because sometimes when we read the Bible, we separate many things out of context. For example, note, all the parables that Jesus spoke after Matthew 24 are warning how not to be deceived. Because Jesus did not mention that in chapter 24. He just said, be careful that you will not be deceived. But his four parables as an extended of Matthew 24 is a means to warn us how not to be deceived. This means that all these four parables have prophetic dimensions for God's people in the last days. These parables are the faithful and evil servant. And Jesus started, if you, if you read this parable of the faithful and evil servant, most of them are pastors, ministers, because the ruler of the house who feed the house in due season. And then the parable of the wise and foolish virgins for the general members. The third parable is the parable of the talents. The last parable is the sheep and the goat. The practical Christianity. So when we read it, let us not separate this from the eschatology of Jesus Christ because they are really, if you look at them, that's what Luke says. The trap, the snare. 
And so here is what? And in fact, Ellen White says, the worldliness, fearful assimilation of God's people in the world, and Satan is working so hard. As Satan sees that his time is short, he has set all agencies to work that men may be deceived, deluded, occupied, entrenched until the day of probation shall end and the door of mercy forever shut. Desire of Ages 637. So there is a ceiling. In the city of Jerusalem, all the Christians were sealed. No one died. And those who did not receive the seal, they were separated. So there was a sign that Jesus was given. When you see the Roman army surround, and it was a miracle according to Ellen White, that when General Sistos was there, they just simply fled because Jesus says, when you see the Romans surrounds the city, the Christian who listened to Jesus is catology and warning. They have time. And then they went into the land, into the place called Pilia, where no one died. And yet, what happened to the Jews? They, they really tried to, to catch the Romans, and they have a war, and they were so happy, and they were really because almost they defeated the Romans. And they become more bold because they said, look what happened. But 70 years later, 1.5 to 2 million Jews died. If you read the Greek controversy, the first chapter, the destruction of Jerusalem is so horrible. Husband killing the wife, the wife killing the husband, stealing the food. Even in fact, they cook their own children. Supposed to be is, is a time where, you know, when, when Sisyus came, it was time of the Passover, but tabernacles. But when General Titus arrived in AD 70, it was the Passover that whole world came. But look what happened. That's why it perished everywhere. Just imagine they are eating their belt, their shoes, trying to go outside Jerusalem to get some, some, some grasses to eat. And yet, before they can get it, others get it and killed one another. And according to Lynn White, the blood was that so much it's like a poured water in every street of Jerusalem. This is the horrible city. And we look at it as a history. No, we need to look at it as a type. This is what happened in planet Earth. One day there will be a final separation. The sealing of God's people and the separation is final. Number nine. The eternal destiny of two groups. Those who listen, who watch, who wait and work and follow Jesus' word, destined to eternal life. But those who ignore went into eternal destruction. So we need to watch. We need to work, to wait. Obeying Christ's words and warnings because eternal destiny of salvation is there. That's why Ellen White at the beginning of what we discussed was that leave all other matters of discourses but present this Matthew 24 because the destiny of soul is there. We need to understand that. And so those who watch and lazy but busy with other things assimilated into the world by Satan's deception, the eternal destiny is condemnation and destruction. Here is the message. The nine imperatives of the book of Matthew, Luke, Mark and Luke, this catological prophecy that is a type that Jesus made mentions. We're just presenting nine. Next time we're going to discuss 
how Satan deceived. Because we discussed that. Seven times in the book of Revelation. Perfect deception. There are deception for pastors. Deception for institution. Colleges and universities. Mission and conferences. There are deception for church members who are inside the church during our worship. There are deception in the way in our workplace. We need to understand this. Because Satan keep on studying, studying how he can win us to his side. But very tricky and very dangerous because it is a deception. Brothers and sisters. This is what Ellen White says. His time is short. He set all agencies to work that we will be deceived, deluded, occupied, in trance until the day of probation in and the door of mercy shut forever. It is my hope and prayer that everyone who share this message, the nine imperatives of realities are utmost importance for everyone who prepares for Christ's coming. So that we will not be deceived and we will watch, wait, and work for the master. This is my prayer.